Hi there, I'm David Mead and welcome to The Virtual Delegate. For one week only, this episode is pre-recorded since we're tied up running an actual real-life client event. But we've got a crack team of experts that are joining us in this one-off, not live episode. So stay tuned. <laughs> As usual, we're coming to you from Belfast's hybrid by design venue, the stunning ICC Belfast. A great virtual or hybrid event lives and dies on reliable tech. So this time we'll discuss what you need to consider when streaming successfully. What are the common pitfalls planners fall victim to? What's the right answer when it comes to delivering events that are live or pre-recorded and every other question in between? So let's take a look at who is in this week's episode of The Virtual Delegate. We'll be joined by Dave Young from ICC Belfast for all of his top tips on how to make your virtual studio extraordinary. We'll also be joined by the top team from Kenos, one of the world's fastest growing technology businesses to explore exactly how they're using virtual events to inspire and engage their team. But first up, it's audience. The team at Audience create experiences to develop meaningful relationships. They drive advocacy and deliver results. Trusted by some of the most exciting organizations in the world to deliver campaigns, activations, events, and experiences, they blend the virtual and the real world seamlessly to communicate with impact. Their team are some of the most experienced and innovative in the country. So I sat down with Natalie and Stephen recently to pick their virtual brains on why, when it comes to virtual events, the devil is in the technical details. Natalie, why is it so important now that if we want a virtual event to be a success, that we work with a production partner? Professionals in the events industry know that most of the work is done in the pre-planning. Um, so we're obviously, we resource um, and scope according to the size of the job. So, you know, we have in-house kind of producers, executive producers, assistant producers, technical managers, Stephen as head of head of the department. Um, so we kind of equip according to the scale of the event and the client requirements and the needs. Um, a lot of clients can't take on that scope themselves. They haven't got the internal resource. Um, everything from our initial kind of critical path timeline document, we make sure it's all followed and it's on track. We schedule weekly project status calls with clients. We gently prompt them and nudge them when things are falling behind. Um, we are fully dedicated, our team are fully dedicated on the job because we have resourced accordingly. Whereas often what we find with clients are, oh, they're doing things on the side. You know, the, the event is just one of many things that they're doing. Um, so they just can't react to changes um, as quickly, I would say. Talk to me about the at-home kits that you provide. I know that you've got a couple of different versions from one that is entry level, but still miles ahead of the standard little camera that is plugged into most of our laptops. But I know you've also got some stunning production ready 4K kits that really do mean that it feels like they're watching a TV show, even though they're producing it from home. When we couldn't do anything in March, April last year, and we had to film from people's homes, uh, we set up a range of kits. We've got three kits, um, and they include audio, visual, and lighting uh, lighting equipment. So cameras, uh, lighting, selfie lights, or panel lights, depending on the package that we go with, and a lapel mic as well. Like with the Wi-Fi solution, it's just about making the best of the at-home environment and enhancing that speaker's laptop with the best kit that we can. We're all at home now, but we know how to set up our screens, we know where to sit, we know how to mitigate risk with the internet, and you can still create a nice piece of content if somebody is at home. I think everyone knows we're all at home, you're not going to hide that, we're in a pandemic. So um, through the at-home kits, we just make the best of, uh, best of the situation. Natalie, there have been many debates over the generations tea or coffee, ant or deck, EastEnders, Coronation Street. But the one that we're all talking about is live or pre-recorded. So tell me, where do you sit on this hot topic? We, as an agency, our ethos isn't to kind of ask our clients, you know, 
what do you think it should be? We kind of base it on on the delivery, the content delivery. Um, and, you know, is there going to be any audience interaction, for example? Um, what's the output? What's the messaging? And um, so we actually work backwards. We never kind of start with the question, you know, would you like this to be live or pre-record? Um, we kind of start the other way and work backwards. And then we kind of um, we put the solution forward that we think would work best. Um, I would say from a platform perspective, their view is always go pre-recorded unless you absolutely have to go live. But actually, um, the technology is in place to be able to facilitate both really smoothly. So, you know, for things like polling, it is really nice to do live because obviously the speaker can comment on the results live on the screen um, and you can't be that real life kind of interaction. Panel discussions, for example, work really work really nicely live as well. But if you've got international speakers on different time zones, for example, it might be best to do pre-record. Um, so the the answer is there is no answer. Um, it completely depends on the content and what you want to get across and what you're delivering. Stephen, what about you? What do you think? I was just going to add, yeah, like obviously if we've got a full day, two days worth of content to deliver, the, the question isn't really is it just pre-record or live? It's what is the actual content format? So can we deliver a message in a different way? Can we can we create a piece of video content? Can it be an interactive session? Does, you know, what 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 is the ultimate objective of that session and what are you looking to achieve? Um, there are benefits to live and pre-recorded. I know you won't like to hear that, but if you do go down the pre-recorded route, um, you've got a lot more control over the final output. You can add in a lot of a higher production value, animations, transitions, and you can really enhance the quality yeah. of it, but then obviously you don't have the live engagement of, of of a live stream. So I think the answer really is to have a mix of all types of content and to really look at what the objectives are and make sure that there's a mix so that we can capture the engagement of the audience throughout the full uh, full program or event. You know, I think I agree with you. Even though for me, live is absolutely everything. I would happily get up at three, four, five o'clock in the morning to do a remote virtual event live rather than pre-record. But then I guess it comes down to the sensibilities of the presenter and the speaker as well. I just see that when you have an event that has a live element and a pre-recorded element, you just see engagement drift and wane through time. So texture probably is key actually, because the truth is, we wouldn't be mitigating risk if we didn't have something that is pre-recorded to cover some, you know, an unexpected issue that might happen. I've also noticed a huge increase in the amount of providers that are offering a simultaneous, exclusively audio feed that they can listen to while hoovering the house, while doing some other work. Because when we're working at home, of course, distraction is king. And this audio model seems to be an interesting way of increasing access and allowing people who like to engage in a slightly different way with the content. Are you seeing that increase? Does that seem like something that will stick around long after the pandemic is over, Natalie? Because we come from an agency background, you know, perspective, we like a mix of communication mediums, really. And I think the visual perspective is never going to go. Um, you know, personally, I think people have really missed that face to face engagement from physical in person events. And I think it's still it's still a massive requirement that people want. They want to put a face to a name. Um, even if you're not necessarily interacting and doing, you know, polling and Q&A, people really want to see who's talking. Um, you know, so for that reason, I always think a mix of communication channels is key. But, you know, things that you said, like audio only podcasts for people on the go that are moving around and they just want to kind of keep in tune. I think those are really popular for sure. Um, but I don't think I don't think that's kind of the, the preference from most clients that we see. Final question uh, to both of you. Stephen, I'll start off with you. Hybrid is the buzzword that is clearly a big part of our future. How do you see your offering shifting and changing, not just over the next year, but perhaps over the next three to five? A hybrid event can mean different things to different people. And um, whether having the audience there in person is really important, it's going to be ultimately up to the client's objectives. If it's absolutely necessary, we would always recommend having a mix of both, taking the good elements of the digital experience and incorporating them into the physical experience. And you can also look at that from a sustainability perspective, an environmental perspective. If we take an, exa uh, an event example that we're delivering in November, typically that um, EMEA event would have a lot of travel alongside it. Um, delivering it in a hybrid model, which we're planning to do, means that there's so much less travel, 
um, budget doesn't have to be spent on accommodation, food and bev, all of these sort of peripheral things around the event, we can actually focus on the content and what is the what is the best way we can deliver that content to the audience at home and in person. And I think uh, one key other key thing that we've been focusing on is making sure that the experience of both of those audience types is as good as the other. So if you're designing a program around the physical agenda, uh, physical attendees that are there, what are the digital attendees going to do when you're having your teas and coffees? Like what can, what added value can we give to that audience above and beyond just sort of asking them to to wait for you to finish your physical uh, like teas and coffees? So I guess designing the hybrid experience with both audiences in mind and taking the the best bits from the last eighteen months that we've learned. The virtual event um, is so cost effective compared to, you know, especially events that are usually a week or two weeks long. Um, so I think from a cost saving perspective, they're not going away. And, you know, touch wood, the virtual events that we've delivered for our clients over the past year um, have proven really successful and um, have, you know, almost provided a benchmark for, you know, um, the next, you know, what next year's event looks like. Um, but, you know, clients do miss the face to face aspect. So I think, you know, hybrid certainly is is the buzzword, as we've already said. But I think the cost saving perspective and giving audiences the option of traveling and staying over versus the comfort of their own home. Um, it's about giving people the option, but there's no compromise on the content. So if you if you can give people an option without compromising the experience, um, I think you've kind of hit a gold mine, really. Here at the Virtual Delegate, we never miss the opportunity to hear from real life clients who rely on the power of remote events to bring their people together. And this week, we have a big one. Kenos is a technology company that's growing at a breakneck speed, operating in two specialist divisions, digital services and its workday practice. They've got 2000 people spread across 12 offices all across the globe. Chris, Grace and Cameron have led many of their virtual meetings. So I began by asking them just how important these events have become. Very early on in the process, we had a quite a structured informal event. So there was Zoom, there was Kahoot quizzes. And what was lovely about it, actually, after about an hour in, people just started having their kids sitting on their laps and joining in. And it was a it was a really human moment whereby actually we're all, you know, it was very early on in the pandemic. And that was kind of, for me, set the tone for us as a group, certainly in the, in the UK. It was a, a lovely thing that it was, we're all working. Our families are closer. And as a result, it kind of, you know, it just re reflected to me kind of what, what we've had to go through the last week. Well, Obviously, for high performing teams to work effectively remotely, they need to have the technology and the hardware. Cameron, what have you guys learned about making sure that people are set up to have virtual events and work virtually remotely at home? I think for us, it was quite an easy transition. A bit of panic at the start, sure, for everyone. Um, I remember the my team's room where we had must have had 100 monitors set up ready for people to take them home. But all in all, I think we were in a good place at the start. And, you know, we've just refined things as we've gone along and um, it's worked out pretty well. Chris, how important would you say having actual virtual events has been to making sure that your team still feel connected, still feel engaged? For me, there's different types of messages that need to be delivered. You know, and obviously before you would have had, you know, you would have, been in, in it been in the building but the, the kind of the principles of communications are still the same so you need those didactic strategy focused events to kind of get people together to understand where the organization is going now traditionally you would have had that in a conference center or you would have been in a in a room with lots of people that need is still there just the mechanism has changed the joy for me is to see how interactive that could as you well know we had we had the event with you and it really did translate we were all a bit nervous going into it but it but it worked it worked saved us some money in, in to, to boot as well which, which was great the next layer down you have your operational meetings you need those as well again they have a different message they're operational they're the cut and thrust of day-to-day -day life Dif different set of messages and a different focus but that equally can be done on the zoom and then finally there's the informal kind of water cooler type conversations. Again, you can't do that, but the need is still there. So it's kind of creating an environment whereby 
I can pick up the phone to Grace, you know, do a Teams chat with Jake Grace and have no fixed agenda, but just catch up and see how you're doing. Those things, those are human needs, all of them. They haven't stopped. We're just delivering them in a different way. Grace, Kenos is a global business. So virtual events are an important part of making sure that people understand your messaging, your strategy. How central have you found virtual events been over the course of the last year? But more importantly, what successes have you seen? Have they worked? Every year as a company, we would have had like a company kickoff and it would have been an in-person event and it would have taken place in three different locations. A kickoff in Gdansk for our Central European employees, one in Belfast for our UK and I, and then one in North America. Those were wonderful events and people really look forward to coming together in person just to catch up, see people that they talk to virtually all the time. You know, maybe people do work together, but there's a lot of people you work with day to day that you just don't see. And then the pandemic hit and all of a sudden all of that was wiped out and there was the need then, an absolute need to still keep, carry on with this important event is that kind of defines Kianos. I remember the week I joined Kianos was the week of kickoff and people said, oh, you've picked a really good week to join. It's kickoff, you know, you're going to make it. And I was like, what the heck is kickoff? But it was honestly the best week to join and I, I loved it. And it was the perfect introduction to the company and to think that people might not get that you know, joining the company in the middle of the pandemic was, you know, that was, that was you know, it's just, not, it felt unfair. So when the opportunity came to host it um, as a virtual event for our business unit within the company, so about a third of the company is um, works for work in our workday business unit, and we are the international business unit as such. So we had to, you know, pull this together and try to recreate that feeling of connectedness, you know, that shared experience. The virtual kickoff was perfect for us in that while we always had these three separate events beforehand in person, this is the first time we were able to bring everyone together in one event um, ever, which was fantastic. In terms of logistics, it was difficult because obviously of time zone differences and things. But everyone really appreciated that feeling of coming together and, you know, sharing that one experience and you know, being able to hear about how the company's doing. It's a chance to also say thank you to the company for or to the employees for everything they've done to keep the company going and for doing so well as they did throughout the pandemic and like we're going from strength to strength which is crazy um but to actually you know have that event and have that one thing that everyone has been at has been incredible i think the one good thing about everyone being remote it's it's a great equalizer there's no there's no idea of where the headquarters and, and you're remote. Everybody, in a sense, is remote. And so I think everybody is just on the same page. I work in a technical support role. And so we talked about new joiners to the company and even just the simple thing of turning on your camera and introducing yourself to that person rather than them joining via an email link. I take that as a big responsibility to make someone feel welcome in the company, speaking with them face to face rather than everything being virtual. Having that connection online, everybody at the same time with the same experience um, really unifies people in that way. Everyone's sort of feeling the same, you know, everyone's going through, like you say, we're all in the same boat. We're all in the same storm in our own boats and doing it whatever way we can. But it means we're all still coming together in the same way from wherever we are. In some ways, it's made it simpler because we still used conference calls and Zoom and Teams before, but what you would have had before is you would have had a hybrid. So there would have been five or six people in a room talking to each other and the other people on the phone trying to listen in or trying to kind of understand what was being said. So in some ways, the, the challenge hasn't been the technology. The fact that te technology has been an equaliser for people around the globe. The real challenge will be as we adapt into kind of post-COVID, our post-COVID world, how do we take and balance the people in the room with the people outside the room because the world is going to change in that regard it'll be interesting to see how we adapt to that hybrid approach because actually it's quite simple in many ways you switch on in two minutes before the call's on Cameron how important have virtual events been in bringing your people together I think in Kianos the the virtual events have been fantastic we had a we're just not long finished a virtual event for our whole company and to have you know around 2,000 people on on one call was just phenomenal each individual employee together as one and i think in person that probably wouldn't have been possible which was why the virtual event was such a success
we get to enjoy it as one and everybody gets the same experience and it's a shared experience and everyone you know they can talk about the buzz afterwards I mean the buzz on LinkedIn was crazy talking about one Kianos and, Kian- and like our, our strategy for Kianos 2025 and the real buzz that came from that and the feeling of togetherness you know, despite us being apart was was incredible and it, it's just it's so uplifting and it just gives you like a like a you know a real kick just to keep carry on and keep going through the year. You know that we've done such a good job, and you just want to keep doing it over and over. In, in the world that we've lived in over the past eighteen months, if we didn't have online events, we would we wouldn't have been able to. In this process, as difficult as it is, is that it, it's possible to deliver value to our customers and deliver ideas and innovation to our customers virtually just as easily as we did previously in the room um, and it's taken the pressure off our travel networks our infrastructure uh, and i think it has to be the future it has to be the future because um we can all live our lives and still do a good job and i think technology and virtual events have to play a key role in that going forward absolutely as we move out of our bedrooms and kitchens and back into studios and hybrid venues the spaces and places where we broadcast from will become an even more important decision ICC Belfast, the home of the virtual delegate, is an industry leader in virtual and hybrid events. They've won the 2020 Event Technology Award for most innovative and tech-friendly venue. They've also been shortlisted for the 2021 Digital Event Awards Best Venue Offering Digital Events Facilities. The production manager in residence is Dave Young, and Dave is an incredibly experienced event producer. He's got 15 years experience in events and entertainment and took time out to share how important a watertight technical setup really is. So tell us, Dave, how tough were the first few months of the pandemic for you, for the team, for the business, for everyone involved in ICC Belfast? So for myself personally, it was very tough. I'd actually only just started three months prior to lockdown at the business. So it was kind of working from home. I was still moving house, moving over from Birmingham. I actually had flown over to Birmingham uh, during lockdown and then all the flights got cancelled. So I I had to do a bit of uh, remote working from Birmingham as well as managing a venue in Belfast. So it was quite exciting. Um, And then it was kind of, we came up with the idea of creating the virtual studio that we're in now. Um, But at that point, I didn't really know where anything was around the venue. So I was coming to the venue. All the technicians had been sadly furloughed at the time. So I was basically going around, uh, breaking down cupboard doors to try and find bits of equipment, see what I could do, put together to make a few virtual events. Um, so it was quite exciting as well to kind of learn your way around the venue by kind of just having a go and having a play. Um, but from that, we kind of built a new studio. We had new technology. Uh, the venue allowed us to purchase new equipment. Uh, new cameras, new streaming accessories. Um, and it was really exciting to have that opportunity to create a new product for the venue. Building something brand new must have been a challenge, but uh, fun at the same time. Yeah, it definitely a challenge. It's a brand new technology. I've done a little bit of live streaming in the past uh, when I was back in Birmingham, but nothing on this scale. So uh, building something brand new, you, there's no guide, there's no right, there's no wrong. It's just kind of have a play. Uh, just put together a few mock-up ideas, put it over to our board in SMT, and they're just like, yeah, go for it. So it's really exciting, but also quite a lot of pressure. I remember kind of thinking the night before the first event going, uh, this is all kind of a bit on my shoulders at the moment. If this goes wrong, they're going to all point the finger at me and go, but this was your idea. What are some of the key lessons that you and your team have learned about virtual and hybrid events over the course of the last year? The most important thing that we've learned from virtual and hybrid events has been you're never going to get it right the first time and you might and you're definitely not going to get it right every time so that could be your technology letting you down it could just be somebody's availability because we're working with people who are at home speakers from home presenters from home and who knows what's going to happen it could even just be a dog that walks in at the background and it's just going to disrupt things but people i think are a bit more understanding of that whether well, we're at the start i think people have kind of got used to the virtual world now and probably kind of less lenient in terms of mistakes but you can sit there and watch breakfast TV in the morning and you'll see callers come, go, connect, disconnect. So people understand that these things happen and we've all experienced some kind of downtime or you're on mute on Zoom or something like that. So these things do happen. And a lot of the time you're working with the unknown. You're working with people who may have never done a live stream session before. So it might be an issue with their own internet connection or their own equipment. And it could even be delegates who have never used this type of interface before. So it can be a case if you can give people guidance, as much guidance as possible, but sometimes they don't even read it. So, um, yeah, you're never going to get it right every time, but it, it, it's a great new technology to use. 
given that so many of our contributors are dialing in from home using their home laptop, their home Wi-Fi, and their home webcam, Dave, how can you mitigate against the issues that those things might fail and might affect your event? It's always planned for the worst case scenario with us. It, you are dealing with so many unknown and uncontrollable elements of internet connections, equipment. Uh, we've even been dealing with CEOs of business. When you speak to them, they go, actually, I don't even own a laptop. I just have a phone and a tablet. Um, so you kind of go, I don't know how you've kind of uh, gone through the, your life without that, but it does happen. Um, so you just have to guide them, hold their hands through this process. Some people are fantastic at it. Some people have got virtual studios at home, like yourself, David, so you're never too sure what people are going to get. Uh, but sometimes it could even be somebody sat in their garden. So it's work with them, try and give them a bit of guidance, positioning of cameras, but it's always have a backup. So in here in the studio, we will have a presenter who is briefed, ready, just in case there's a dropout, we can go straight to that presenter or there's a bit of content that we can jump to. So always have that redundancy piece in place, just in case those unknown variables do come in. There are so many options out there from a tech point of view. What investments do you think event professionals should be making today, whether it's in hardware, software, or even in their people to make sure that they're ready for the future? I guess it all depends on kind of what route you're going to go down if you're an agency, if you're a venue, or if you're somebody streaming from home. So it could be a case of you're just looking for that right supplier with that right equipment, or if you want to invest yourself. So make sure you've got some nice cameras. Obviously, you can stream from your laptop, but at the end of the day, your laptop camera is always going to be a strange height. You're going to be looking at people from weird angles and weird positions. So if you get a separate camera, that's great. Lighting is always an important thing, especially if you're doing a call. Make sure you've got some good lighting. Obviously, we're not expecting anybody to have studio production lighting like we've got here, but even just a £5 Amazon ring light that you can pop around your webcam just makes the world of difference. In terms of software, it's getting a platform or a ser service that you're used to and that you think is suitable to your event. There's not one size fits all. We use a platform which is kind of hybrid by design to when we are able to open as a venue. The same platform is on somebody's knee on the front row as it is in somebody in America who's interacting with the event. But some people might just be happy using Zoom. It, it, and it all depends on kind of what event it's going to be. And in terms of staffing, it's, it's incredible to see how the world of technicians has changed over the last 18 months. 18 months ago, not maybe even 12 months ago, a Zoom technician was a title that nobody had ever heard of. Now it's an essential part of an AV technician's CV. So just go out there and make sure that your staff are familiar with this setup, familiar with the technology, and they know the way around whichever software, whether that be vMix or Livestream Studios or OBS, make sure they have a full understanding of what it's going to be. Because if not, you're going to end up with random camera shots, random laptop screens and random screens. So it's just make sure that everyone's familiar, but there's not one size fits all with all of them. But it's kind of look at your event, look at your needs and see where it all fits. After a year of tremendous uncertainty, how excited are you and your team about the future of virtual and hybrid? We cannot wait to get the world of hybrid going in the venue. We've kind of invested so much in some of our streaming capabilities here, whether that be cameras. We've got literally shelves and shelves of cameras at the moment, which 18 months ago, I don't think as a venue, we even owned a camera. So it's how that's changed so quickly. So all these cameras that we use in this space at the moment are going to be situated in every single space around the building. So if somebody walks into a room and goes, actually, we need this session live streamed, we can do it instantly. Uh, we've got obviously the investment in the hybrid studio here and how this has changed in the last 12 months from wooden panels around the back to now this huge LED wall that I'm sat in right now. Uh, and the technology is just growing and growing. There's new bits of technology coming in, new softwares, new ways of doing things. I know the team are just really excited about the new opportunities that we've got as a venue. So there you have it, our first ever pre-recorded episode of The Virtual Delegate, and I promise you, our last one as well. I passionately believe in the power of live events, so make sure that you join us back here next week. Remember, The Virtual Delegate is your home of innovative and exciting ideas to take your next hybrid or virtual event to the next level. I'll see you next time on The Virtual Delegate. Yeah.